Good morning and welcome to another Insight AppSed seminar webinar and welcome to everyone joining us on webinar land. To start with I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which this event is taking place this morning and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. And I'd like to extend that to anyone in, in webinar land or in the room of Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander descent that may be joining us. So welcome. It gives me great pleasure today to welcome a, uh, Dr. Renee Zano from the University of Queensland. She's a lecturer in criminology and her focus is on steroid use and steroids. This is something that uh, the NSP downstairs in this building, we're aware that many of the clients that come through and access our needles are steroid users, but I think it's a client base that as clinicians we may not know a great deal about or have a lot of contact with, so I'm looking forward to this. So it gives me great pleasure to welcome Dr. Renee Zano. Thanks so much, Jim, um, and thanks for having me along today, everybody. So I'm just going to talk a bit today about a range of different things associated with the use of anabolic steroids, mainly about some of the risks, about what we know about people who use steroids, um, and just maybe some ways that we can reduce the risks associated with, with, um, with utilising steroids. So if, um, if people think of questions as we're going along, um, we might save them up for the end um, and then have any discussions as we at the end. So what do we know about steroids? Well, when we think about the, the typical steroid user, most of us probably get the image in our head of the big bodybuilders or of the professional sports cheat like the Lance Armstrongs. These are the images that the media conjures up in our mind. And this um, is probably because this is where um, steroid use started. So the first documented kind of use on a world stage was really um, by Russian weightlifters in the 1950s. Um, from this point, steroid use spread into other sports um, and also into competitive bodybuilding. Now, what we know though is whilst these are the areas that we tend to think of mostly when we think of steroid use, this is less than 1% of the steroid using population. Most of the steroid population is actually the general population and this actually, um, use in the general population actually stemmed from popular culture. In the late 1980s and early 1990s, Arnold Schwarzenegger um, break, um, and came onto our silver screens um, as the Terminator, Conan the Barbarian. We had um, Sly Stallone, um, Rocky. And this really was the very first time that this hyper-masculine, hyper-muscular, idealised form of, of the male body um, was something that was really globalised and sent out worldwide. And since that time, um, we've really seen the spread of um, this, of steroid use amongst the general population. Um, in the, with the use now of social media as well, we have a spread of um, showing of images of the body. Um, and so we have ways in which the image of the self has become something that is um, very much, um, you know, that's out there for public approval all the time. So it's probably become a little bit more at the centre of people's um, identity. So um, anabolic steroids actually fall under a group of drugs known as performance and image enhancement drugs. Now you've probably heard of this term before, and this includes all muscle drugs, weight loss drugs and image enhancers like melanotan. Um, a relatively new category um, that has been um, created is this larger, broader category called human enhancement drugs. So this includes things like sexual enhancers, cognitive enhancers, and social behavioural and mood enhancers. So there's this growing kind of um, group of drugs 
that are really about these enhancements. Um, so cognitive enhancers is particularly something that's also becoming um, more frequently used and of a little bit more interest to people. Um, but oftentimes you'll hear um, anabolic steroids or steroids be used to refer to all of the peds. So most people use the term steroids, but they could be referring to any muscle drugs or, um, or weight loss drugs and things like that. If you're interested in knowing more about the categories, I know that you can't read that um, from where you are. This is just, I wanted to provide this link for you. Um, there is um, a colleague of mine runs this website, Human Enhancement Drugs. If you're interested in knowing more about any of those types of um, drugs or those categories, you can go to this website. Um, they have sort of monthly people, monthly they have people um, give it, putting little blogs up there and all that sort of thing. So that can, um, has got some interesting information if you're wanting to have a look. So as I mentioned before, um, mostly what we know about steroid use, we know from the media. And our perceptions of who uses steroids also comes from the media. These are the types of headlines that we hear about steroid use. One of the problems is um, steroid use gets associated with particular characteristics and particular people. So we see that they get associated with athletes, the gym, bodybuilding, but also um, they get associated with violence, um, with particular characteristics like um, in jobs, like here's soldiers, we've got the London Bridge attacks. Here in Queensland, um, they've been associated with the bikies um, and organised crime. So that we have this very negative view of, of them being quite evil and sinister and associated with these terrible groups. On the other hand, um, we also have in the media this quite trivialised perception of advertising and things using the term on steroids to be, oh look, this product is such and such on steroids. This is a cheeseburger on steroids. This is data science on steroids. This is teacher training on steroids. So we have this very conflicting kind of um, understanding or, or view of what steroids are and, and how we should be perceiving steroids. And I think that um, that really does demonstrate and encapsulate that steroids really sort of don't fit with anything. So what we have, when you think about yourself in, um, you know, in your own responses in alcohol and other drugs, steroids sort of don't traditionally fit with substance abuse drugs. At the same time, they don't really fit with sports, vitamins and nutrition supplements um, because they're still an illicit substance. So it's, it's a very tricky space and they sort of don't really fit anywhere. And I think that people are, um, you know, they find it difficult, as in professionals, we find it very difficult to, um, to manage our own perceptions of these sorts of things. Why is it important? Why do we care about how the media and the society perceive these um, drugs? Because this affects not only whether or not people have a um, propensity to use or not use the drug, but also whether or not they'll access services. So whether or not that if they do, um, if people do have adverse effects, they're likely to seek help. And also if they're likely to, to come to services like your own, like needle and syringe exchange, and feel like they can access those services without being judged. So that does impact people's propensity to utilise services. Um, so what about the level of use in Australia and um, also the UK? So I should just say, um, I'll be presenting um, statistics from Australia and the UK because I actually, most of my research is conducted with people in the UK. I have a fellowship with um, the UK Public Health um, School at the Liverpool University. So I do a lot of work with them. Um, our 
household population survey shows that we have a low and um, and steady group of people, uh, pro proportion of people in the population utilising steroids and that this hasn't increased for a long time. Um, that said, we know that there are limitations with household surveys. Um, there, what we do know is that there is a growing population of people accessing NSP services who state that their, their drug that they're using is steroids. So we do know that in terms of service provision, that there is a growing need in this area. Um, so here, um, I've got some, some statistics up there between 2010 and 2016 here in Australia, um, particularly clustered in New South Wales and Queensland, we had an increase from about 2% of the total number of people um, accessing NSPs to about seven um, that, were, that reported that anabolic steroids were the drug that they last injected. Um, in the UK, the problem is um, quite significantly um, greater in terms of um, over half of the people who use NSPs report that their most um, recently injected drug was steroids. So their NSPs actually um, service a lot of steroid users um, and that's you know a good thing um, as well because we know then that they're accessible and the education's getting out there. This actually um, is data from the Gold Coast. So this, I'd like to just quickly thank Nick too from Quinn down at the Gold Coast. This is data from them um, from 2016 and 17. So this is showing the trend in different types of drugs and access, so this is the number of people accessing different types of drugs at the NSP. We can see the top line there is um, opioids. So this is people who are accessing for opioids, they're obviously the top, but we can see that the trend line is relatively flat. The second line, the dark grey one, that's methamphetamines and amphetamines. Um, unfortunately, we can't separate the, between the two because I think that would be really interesting So I, I feel like we might have a decline in amphetamines and, and an increase in the other, but that's just um, conjecture. Um, and then the red one is iPads. iPads are just one group, but the, generally they're mainly steroids. Um, and we can see that the red line has got an increase um, occurring. We don't have enough data to say that this isn't seasonal um, because people might be using more um, at the end of summer over winter because they might be bulking because people tend to, we're going to talk about cycling soon, people tend to bulk over winter and then they strip down over summer so they look very lean. So um, that could be some of it. But you can see there that, um, you know, certainly, I mean, there doesn't seem to be a large increase, but compared to the proportion that is being used in these other drugs, we can see that steroids are starting to, to grow a little. So people can use three steroids in three different ways. Um, there's three different ways of administering. We can, they can inject, they can use orally, and you can apply to the skin like through a lotion or an oil. Um, what we've found in a study that we've just been doing recently is even though people tend to think that in, people start with using orally and then move to injecting. That's not necessarily the way that use occurs. About 30% of people will never inject, they'll only use orally. Um, about 30% will never use orally, they'll only ever inject. And then about, about a third will, will do both. Um, so, each of each way, like each mode of administration has different risks associated with it. So oral steroids tend to be um, the older ones as well, particularly more toxic to the liver, um, which can be really problematic. Um, obviously with the injecting ones, um, you've got the risk of injection related um, kind of illnesses and, and, and infections and things. Um, one of the things um, 
about all of these is obviously the problems with um, purchasing products off the black market and the unregulated nature of these products. And that's one of the key issues. Whilst it isn't really possible to have immediate like emergency overdose of steroids, which is why I think some people um, think that the risks are not that high. Um, there are risks associated with having, you know, adulterated products. So this can be um, a problem because when products are made on the black market, it can be issues associated with um, not only them being contaminated, but just things like the manufacturing process is not um, really great. So like the mixing may not be precise which means some dosages might be stronger than others if the active ingredient isn't mixed through and things like that. Um, oftentimes, steroids might be stacked with other peas to try and maximise um, their ability to build muscle and to, to strip fat. So things like human growth hormone, insulin, clenbuterol, are things that you may have heard before, heard of. So um, the use of insulin is actually quite dangerous, um, particularly if it's getting used around training time because it can cause sudden and dramatic drops in blood glucose level um, and sudden um, lapse into a coma. This is particularly problematic. Um, you know, if people have been for a really long training session, um, and then they suddenly drink like a protein shake or something like that. This can be digested very quickly if they then lay down for a rest. Um, you know, this can, this can have severe consequences. Clenbuterol is actually a veterinary product. It's, um, it's used for respiratory problems in horses, um, but it's a fat burner. It's used as an illegal fat burner. Um, it also can have very significant um, side effects. Um, it increases the heart rate, um, and there has been deaths associated with the use of clenbuterol. Um, in terms of immediate and emergency situations, I would say that they are associated with these other peds, not the steroids. In terms of things like an immediate problem that uh, it results in an immediate kind of you know emergency situation as i said steroids can also be stacked with other steroids so stacking is something you may have heard of people who come into your service may may talk about stacking um, so stacking is about mix, mixing and matching various types of anabolic hormones so and this is in order to make to obtain the maximum result so we all have different levels of hormones in our body naturally so in the, we have these individualized optimal levels um, for muscle growth and so it's about trial and error and about adapting working out what your body is going to operate best on the other thing you may have heard people speak about is cycling so the use of anabolic steroids generally happens in cycles. So these cycles can be um, six to 12 or 16 weeks long. Um, and what this is for is to avoid adapting a tolerance to the steroids over time and to minimize the effect on um, decreasing your, own, your body's own ability um, to naturally produce testosterone. So generally over time, what seems to have happened is cycles have gotten longer. Um, cycles used to be really more around eight weeks, but there's evidence to suggest that currently in Australia and in the UK, the average is 13 weeks um, with a movement and trend towards blast and cruise. So this blast and cruise method is about being on high levels of, of um, steroids and then maintaining a base level but never coming off. So what this means, this I, I um, believe in, and you know scholars believe has 
happen because people are worried about losing that level of muscle. They don't want to get little. They don't want to get small. So it's like they go through a maintenance and then a building phase, um, but never actually come off. Now, this could be a problem because of developing tolerance, um, but also because it could reduce their ability to avoid long-term issues. All right, so your body's always then dealing with the steroids, not having a break. Then generally it would be recommended that you should follow um, a, an on cycle with a cycle off that is this, about the same time length. So um, this can you know, help to reduce the side effects. People also um, can engage with post-cycle therapy. These are particular drugs um, that can help to block estrogen um, and they can also help to reduce um, the side effects um, and also to assist in restarting the natural testosterone production. So this can help getting those, um, the natural production of testosterone started and help reduce the impact on mood. Because one of the things um, that is really difficult to deal with when you're coming to the end of a cycle and may trigger people to go back onto a cycle um, immediately in instead of staying off is that they can have very um, significant reductions in mood, so very depressed mood due to the drop in the hormones, okay? So this is an example of what um, a cycle then may look like. So this is the stacking. So we've got here Sustanon, Deca and Anadrol. So the first two are injectables and Anadrol is um, an oral steroid. So you can see here the amount they're taking per week in the injectables and then each day with the oral and then Arimidax is an estrogen blocker that they're taking. So they're taking this each other day. So you can see the way a cycle might be set up with the stacking where they're injecting these drugs and then taking these others orally, all right? So taking multiple drugs at a time. The thing to recognize though, is that this is just one example and that there is a lot of variation. So individuals, um, will vary in in the way that they they stack their drugs and cycle the drugs um, so when we think about the variations um, what we what I noted at the beginning and what um, sort of that variation brings up again now is this recognition that we are having a diversification of why people use steroids so in the beginning we had the weightlifters and the athletes but now we've got lots of different motivations. Some people don't use to for performance reasons. They don't use because they want to be he lifting heavy weights at the gym. They're using for image or they're using as primarily as a fat burner, um, just for different reasons. So the use is motivated by different things. Thinking about this, um, Christensen and his colleagues over in Denmark came up with these four Type. So they said there's kind of these four categories that we can put most people into. Um, now they came up with these four categories based on a review of the literature, so all the studies that had been done, and then their own interviews with 37 people. Okay, so I just want you to sort of, you know, think these are just something they're sort of coming up with. Um, and basically on they, they started to think about the effectiveness of use and then the risks that they're willing to take. And they suggested that there was this, that everyone could be put into one of four categories. Um, the YOLO type, so this is the you only live once type. So these are the people who are impatient and risky. Um, they're young, they're kind of not really concerned with the side effects or the diet and training and recovery. They just want to get buff for stereosonic. Like they want to go to the, to the, um, you know, the music festival and they want to take their shirt off and it's kind of a short term thing. They're not thinking about the long term. Then we have the wellbeing type. Now these are the people who are really sort of thinking about safe use, um, 
they're thinking about making slight improvements. They might be the recreational gym goer, you know, they might be the weekend warrior, sort of out doing a bit of CrossFit. Um, they have medium knowledge, but they're, it's moderate use. So they're not using to extreme. Um, it's something that they're doing to perhaps to assist with their recovery, um, these sorts of things. Then we have the athlete type. So this is the person who's performance focused. Um, they are concerned about side effects, but they're willing to take risk if it means achieving in their sport. So these are the people who have, they actually have a high level of knowledge, but they also take a high level of risk and they, are, they engage in polypharmacy, use lots of different products, um, and, but they also have highly specialized plans um, and diets and things because they are um, people who are either professional athletes or bodybuilders or very concerned with the performance outcomes. Finally, we have the expert type. These are people who are very, very interested in almost treating themselves like an experiment. So they're monitoring their health and their body. They're really thinking about the, the kind of what's going in, what's going out, muscularity, learning about what's going on and taking a really keen interest in understanding the way that the drugs are impacting their body and how to really precisely get the best um, effects that they possibly can. So this was really interesting and they published this paper, but they hadn't tested this. They hadn't really taken a larger population of people and said, well, does this really exist? So we um, had data from a survey of 611 um, men from the UK, from NSPs and um, gyms in the UK. So we utilised their data to test whether these categories existed and what predicted membership in each of these in each of the categories so we conducted a cluster analysis which is just an, an analytic um, method that establishes the number of groups and puts people into groups from your sample based on how similar and how different particular individuals are um, on all the characteristics that you put in. So it takes a bunch of characteristics and says, this, uh, cutting the, this, the, pop, the sample in this way into four, five, six, seven groups is the way to make the in-groups most similar and the greatest distance between groups. So we did that and then we had a look at what predicted membership in each group. And we actually found evidence to support those four groups existing. So here's what we found. We found that we had cluster one, which was young. These were people who were younger. They typically only used oral steroids. They were, had very high levels of alcohol use, particularly binge drinking, and they experienced few adverse effects. At first we thought this is odd because we thought that they had really risky use. And then we thought, but their use is short term. They're only using short term. So they're not really experiencing any, any adverse effects as yet. We had cluster two, which we thought was the wellbeing group because they were unlikely to use anything other than just the basic steroids. They would typically use few types. Um, it was moderate consumption of alcohol and they experienced few side effects. Cluster three um, used a range of both injectable and oral steroids. Um, they had moderate to low levels of alcohol use, but greater use of psychoactive drugs. Now, this we thought could have been because of the, they could be using stimulants or prescription pain relief, um, which we know um, can be used by people who are engaging in high levels of sport or bodybuilding or weightlifting. Um, and they did experience more adverse effects, which this seems to um, represent similar characteristics to the athlete type. Um, and then cluster four, they typically use few types of um, steroids, but moderately used peptides and other iPads. Um, they rarely drank alcohol or use any other psychoactive drugs. And they experienced very few side effects. And we thought that this group really was reflective 
of um, the expert type. So we, we sort of did feel like they reflected those groups. We then had a look at what motivated the use of steroids for each of these groups. And we found that cluster one, the younger people, they were really motivated by fat loss. They, they said their steroid use was primarily about getting lean. Um, with cluster three, sorry, with this type of analysis, you have to just have a reference group. So we, we don't know um, what, so cluster two was our reference group because that was the largest group, the wellbeing group. Cluster three, um, their main goal was to gain muscle. You know, and that fits if it's the athlete group who are really about bodybuilding and about um, weightlifting and about these sorts of things. And then the expert type were really about getting fitter and healthier. So they were about health and overall body fitness. So we thought that these sort of motivations seemed to fit with those categories, the YOLO, the wellbeing, the athlete and the expert. So we think that's a relatively good way of thinking about the different types of people um, or different types of approach, approaches to steroid use that might be out there. And why does this matter? Why do we care if there is different approaches to using steroids? Because they could be associated with different risk profiles. When we th so what are the risks associated with steroid use? And what type of behaviours might exacerbate or help to limit that risk? This, um, the iPad survey, that's the people who we did the study on, the 611 dudes. So here, this is looking at some of their behaviours. So you can see here that the rate of hep B, hep C or HIV is relatively um, small, um, relatively low. Um, but they have high levels of unprotected sex, which is, you know, another risky behaviour. Um, relatively reasonable levels of cannabis and cocaine use. Um, adverse effects are, you know, relatively low. Um, there, but most of them are injecting anabolic steroids more so than than other other things. Most of them are, are um, injecting glutes, quads, etc. This is a similar survey that a very small one that was done with people who were attending um, Quinn down on the Gold Coast. Um, so this is with um, people who had um, 20 people who had attended the Gold Coast clinic for um, steroid equipment. Um, so this was just asking them some questions. What's really interesting about steroid people who use steroids is that they actually have a high level of um, concern about health they, they really are quite aware and they want, to, they want to do the right thing. But there is this dominant kind of myth or, or miseducation that bloodborne viruses are not really an issue because it's mus intermuscular injecting and not intravenous. Um, so there is a lack of knowledge about bloodborne viruses. And some of that may also stem from the fact that this particular, um, people who use steroids tend to self-differentiate from drug users. So they don't necessarily place themselves in that group. So population-based or community-based education or knowledge or um, education campaigns about, you know, safe injecting or anything like that, that are, are targeted towards anyone using drugs, they don't really necessarily pick up on that being them um, because they don't really see themselves as being an injecting drug user. So that's something to sort of just bear in mind is that their life, um, that, that personally themselves they don't identify with that group um, and their lifestyles um, tend to be slightly different to those that you might um, typically deal, um, you know, experience with people who are utilising other drugs um, that come by your service. Um, but anyway, so as you can see, most of them always use sterile equipment, but the knowledge about bloodborne virus, less than half know anything about it. Um, lots of them are getting their information from the internet. 
Lots of them, though, felt that they would benefit from an education sen se um, session. Less of them knew if they would come or not. So there is, an, there is certainly a perception that they need more education. And there's certainly, I, I believe, um, people who use steroids want more good information. They really want more good information. Um, but it's, it's knowing where to get that information and how to access it. One of the biggest problems um, is, like I said earlier, 30% of people will only ever use orally. Now, the only services provided um, or, or the main avenue to get, a, to get information is really through NSPs. Now, if you're not an injector, when are you ever going to really get information? You're going to get, have to get your own information off the internet, aren't you? You know, there, are, there is information available on the internet. There's, um, you know, lots of information available on the internet. But when you're on the internet and you're getting information um, from legitimate sources, it's also very easy to get distracted by illegitimate sources and forums and things. And there's, um, so it can be very difficult then to sort of determine which sort of information you should be paying attention to. Um, so I think that's that's an issue. Um, the other thing with steroids is, um, as I said, they're intermuscular, not um, intravenous. And because a lot of people inject in the glutes, they may have someone else injecting them. Um, so this can be something to think about in terms of um, a risk a risk factor um, that's maybe a bit different. To others, I know that other drugs intravenously, people often still, you know, they get injected by others, but it's, you know, something they can probably supervise a little bit, bit more. Um, so that's just something to think about. So I guess um, when we think about the illicit nature of steroids, um, and we think about some of the long-term health consequences, we might question why people use. But at the end of the day, the reason people use is because they work. If you take steroids and you have a very good diet and train really hard, you'll get results. Um, and there's absolutely no way that you can pretend that's not the case. All right? So I don't know how many of you have heard of Ziz. This is Ziz. Um, so this was Ziz's journey, which he documented online, um, from being a very um, thin ectomorph to being an, an Adonis here. Um, and unfortunately, Ziz did pass away. Um, and so perhaps, you know, it's, and he was only very young at the time. There is um, controversy over whether or not that was related to the steroids. But um, yeah, uh, you can see though that in terms of seeing um, benefits for somebody who's utilizing steroids, they can see benefits, you know? And when you think about the impacts on health, they're insidious, they're happening inside the body, they can't necessarily be seen, and particularly they may not happen straight away. The impacts of steroids tend to be in five more years time. So they're down the track. So you've got immediate benefits and you've got long-term risk factors, which is very, very difficult um, to decide to go with the risk factors, um, put more um, weight on them when they're not occurring yet. So, as I said, provided um, that you also exercise and um, have good nutrition, you can get very good results. You know, up to nine kilos in eight weeks, seven, seven kilos of muscle. Um, but these are some of the um, 
medical or health effects that could result from the use of steroids. Now this is over time and this isn't everyone and that's important to remember. It does depend on use, dosages, um, you know, how you cycle, all of those things. Um, but certainly there is, um, you know, an effect on the cardiovascular system, reproductive health, for oral steroids, they have an impact on liver, so liver toxicity. Um, they, as I said, the fluctuations in hormones can impact the mood, so you can get depression and anxiety. People can get acne, um, gynecomastia, um, so men can get what they call bitch tits, um, hair loss, those sorts of things. Um, Things that aren't supported, that have been um, sort of raised in the media and also, you know, in popular culture, people tend to talk about it, is, is, is roid rage. So there's really no academic evidence to suggest that um, we really know or just really support that that's the case. Um, and we don't really know anything too much about cancers and things as yet. Um, we have started doing some work on the brain that shows that there does seem to be um, an association between long-term steroid use and um, brain, um, the brain activity in terms of there seems to be increased kind of breakdown of certain areas of the brain um, in people who have had long-term use of steroids. So. Um, that's just something to sort of keep an eye, keep an eye on that literature. The other thing, as I mentioned before, that's a big risk factor with um, steroids, like any kind of illicit acti um, drug, is that the, reg the manufacturer is not regulated. So in a sample of 43 samples purchased from Belgium and the ne Netherlands, um, a very small pro proportion actually um, contained 90 to 100% of what they said they contained of the active product. So 16% only contained the product that they said they did. Um, of all the substances that were um, tested, 16%, nothing in the product could be identified. So no, it wasn't clear what was in that product at all. Um, so that's quite interesting. Um, here you can see the largest group, 26%, only had 1 to 50% of the active ingredient they claimed to have. So this is a large problem in that people aren't getting what they think they're getting. Um, they could be getting something else. They may have a reaction to this other thing. The other issue is that if you're monitoring your use over time and you think, oh, well, I can now take this much because last time I could take, you know, 500 milligrams, next time I can take 600, but the next time you've actually got 100% and last time you only had 50% strength of what it said it was supposed to be, then that could be significantly too much. So it's, it's hugely problematic with being able to monitor the amount that you're getting. Um, and it can be very, very difficult if you're trying to have, you're trying to be very planned and be very conscientious in your cycle and your stacking when the quality is so poor and unreliable. So what I would say is a lot of people who use steroids, yes, they're trying to be conscientious and they're saying that they would like to use in the most risk-free way, but it's actually very, very difficult um, because the products make it difficult to do that. In terms of, P, uh, in terms of injection related risk, so there is actually, um, so there's quite a low prevalence of HIV, um, hep C and bloodborne virus. But one of the problems is that testing uptake is very poor and there's little awareness. So um, it's important that you know, we start to really think about making this something that is that, uh, like raising the awareness, just so that people know that if you're injecting drugs of any kind, this is actually something that's really important. 
um, to, to get tested for um, and then also to, to sort of keep in mind. Probably more significant though for this particular group is um, hygiene around injecting. Things like um, making sure your skin is clean before injecting, um, particularly if they're using after, you know, uh, a training session, all sweaty, that sort of thing, just to avoid ulcers and abscesses and those sorts of things. Um, in terms of injection related risks, most PEDS users um, don't share needles, which is, you know, great. Um, lots of them are injected by other people and they may be exposed to blood spatters because of this too. Um, they generally inject in the shoulder or in the glutes. Um, they tend to be the main areas. But some people do inject into small muscle groups and this can be a problem. There is some people, um, and this again relates to lack of knowledge, who think that you can um, site inject and get growth in that area. So for example, they might think that if you inject in your biceps, you're going to get very large biceps and that they want to inject in their biceps because that's what they want, where they want growth. Um, so it's about really educating people that, you know, that's not the way that steroids work. Um, it's not about injecting into a particular site. They get, you know, pushed through the body rather than working on a particular site. Because injecting into a small muscle is actually problematic because it puts more pressure on that small muscle, more damage on that muscle, particularly if you're already training that muscle, okay? What about dependence and addiction? Well, the general understanding is that there is no physical addiction to the substance itself. But um, there is a belief that people do develop an, a dependence, but it's mainly psychological. And this can be through two particular pathways. One of them is through the body image pathway. So this is fear over getting small. So people use steroids, their normal view of themselves then becomes quite different because their body changes. Um, and they fear that going off the steroids means they get quite small. Um, and so this keeps them using. The other um, way is what they call the post-cycle blues. So this is because when you come off the steroids, you get a, very, a huge drop in mood related to the change in hormone levels. And because this depression can be feel so awful, it might trigger people to start using straight away again because that's the only way to avoid the drop in mood. Um, so this can, can lead to a cycle of continued use. Um, so just to sum up, you know, there are a range of adverse effects. Um, but there are also ways to minimise the risk and that, you know, as being people who come into contact with people who are using steroids, you can sort of help them to minimise their risks. Scare campaigns um, don't work. Um, they've undermined the trust um, in legitimate information. So sort of, you know, this all steroids are evil um, is not really helping. Um, sure, we don't want to say that we want people to use steroids, that's not what we, we want, but um, it's important that we give good information that is based on the facts and on, on um, good evidence. Um, and we do have to recognise that the needs of steroid users do differ from other user groups um, and that they ha and that there are particular things um, that they need in order to encourage them to engage with services. For example, other psychoactive drug users, one of their risks might be sharing needles, whereas for the recreational steroid user, it's more about letting someone else inject them or sharing vials, it's more of the problem. Um, for the recreational drug user, it might be about these rush injections on the street, but for the recreational drug um, 
steroid user, it might be that they've l about learning, the risk might be about learning incorrect injection practices from the gym. Um, poly drug use using ex, um, other recreational drugs might be the problem for the recreational or psychoactive drug user versus the steroid user, which it might be about stacking um, different steroids. Taking regular breaks is also something that's important um, and something that's ped specific. So, you know, just trying to get um, that education out there that it is actually important to come off. These are some ideas about things that can be addressed. Um, I'll just move on, I'm mindful of the time. And just wanted to finish up with this, why do users seek help? So we did a study a couple, um, couple of years ago that was looking at reasons that people gave. So this was using um, a sample of about a thousand people um, on an international survey who said that they experienced worries, um, uh, who said that they'd used steroids. Now, a number of them had said that they experienced worries and then we asked them whether or not they had sought help and then why or why not? For those who said they experienced worries and they had sought help from a medical professional, we asked, you know, what was it about? People who um, experienced problems with sexual function were the most likely to visit a doctor. They were there. The people who experienced change in sexual organs, they were the least likely. You know, change in, in breasts, breast size, testicles, testicle size, any of that. So we thought this is probably about shame. You know, you don't want to rock up to a doctor and go, look, my balls have shrunk. Um, most dudes would probably find that quite confronting. Um, but in terms of, but it could also be related to what we know about treatment availability. Like, I think the general population know about you know, Viagra or similar treatments for sexual function. So that's something that, you know, you can go to the doctor and get a fairly simple, um, you know, re simple um, solution for without having to give up the steroids. The solution for the, ste for the sexual organs is going to be stop the use. So perhaps that's why um, that could be one explanation. For those that didn't seek help, even though they had considerable worries, um, the main reason was that they didn't really think the problem was serious enough. The second um, largest reason given was shame or stigma or feelings that the doctor really couldn't help. There was nothing they could do. So that fits with our kind of reasoning about, you know, they'll go to the doctor if they think there's something that can be done and if it's not too embarrassing. A small proportion of people thought that the doctor wouldn't want to help them. They'd choose not to help because it was an illicit activity. But that was, um, you know, a fairly small number of people who were saying that. Um, and because some places, um, their medical insurance is different than in Australia, we did ask about that, but that didn't <laughs> seem to really factor in. But we do know that, you know, with steroid use in particular, we tend to have um, more people who are working um, and in the higher kind of working or, you know, class rather than or, um, or, or more um, lower levels of socioeconomic groups. The types of treatment that they received and perceived as helpful were things that not only were about a practical um, kind of test or and getting a result but something that would have also included some talking and maybe a little bit of education so the hepatitis um, and blood virus screening the diabetes test which would have been about you know what this is doing in terms of hormones um, and the discussion about mood which i thought was really interesting and really shows again the way that people who generally this 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 group of people who use who are using steroids are very interested in knowing more about the health effects and in trying to monitor those and manage them as best possible. Questions? Thank you, Dr. Renee, for a good presentation. Have we got any questions in the room? Yes, we have one. Hang on. Uh, 
my question is, um, most of the images were males, so is, what's the difference kind of in rates between males and females? And then um, there were the four groups. Is there a difference again in those groups? Yep, so this is really interesting. I'm glad you brought this up. So um, one of the biggest issues is there there is a small number of females who use steroids compared to males, but well, that's what we think. But one of the biggest issues is the stigma attached to females using steroids is much higher. So we have a problem with accessing people, women who use steroids, because they, they're not likely to come forward. They're, they're less likely. We know that there are peop, um, women who use steroids, certainly in terms of like illegal fat burners and things as well. But we also know that there are, are more issues associated and it's more complicated for women because testosterone um, is going to have more implications for them than for men. Unfortunately, we most of our survey participants and most information is on men. So we don't really know a lot about women. But this is a huge problem because we do have growing rates of use amongst women. There's some people in Melbourne, um, Kay um, Stan Stantham, I think that she has been here before, um, is doing a little bit of um, work with some women down there just to try and sort of understand uh, a little bit more about patterns of use and effects of use. But we thought about doing the cluster analysis on women um, to see if there may be different groups amongst women or if they fit with those four groups or if they are perhaps a fifth group. But we didn't have it. We just don't have enough people, like in to do anything analytic. Um, but yeah, really good comment. Um, thanks for your presentation, Renee. I'm very naive to the whole steroid thing, and I just have a question um, that I get often in training, and it's around the psycho psychoactive um, experience of people who use steroids. And whether there is a, a psych, whether it's acting on these, any um, of our known psychoactive um, neurotransmitters, um, I can understand that you see that um, addiction, uh, and that when people are getting that kind of feedback, you've got that rush of dopamine that would, would feed into that cycle. I understand that, but I often get, aren't they psychoactive as well? No. So there's no evidence of that, um, and so. What it really is, is, um, you know, the psychological impacts of, and, and also the exercise. Like we know that, you know, lifting heavy weights, ex you know, we get this adrenaline, we get these sorts of effects. Um, perhaps as well, if it's people who are training in that environment, you know, people who are training might take stimulants, um, as in not illicit stim stimulants per se, but, pre-workouts and all of these sorts of things they get themselves quite you know they're loud music and this sort of thing but the evidence doesn't suggest that there is a psychoactive um, element so no worries thank you um, we have one question coming from webinar land and I don't know if you'll uh, be able to answer this but we'll have a go um, do you know if Quinn have any online education regarding harm minimisation that steroid users can access? Um, not online, but they do have um, a number um, of some some people that you can call to get more information, and that service is is excellent. Um, and certainly, if you called them, they would be able to give you that number. Fabulous. Thank you. And it's, I found it really interesting that um, the steroid users uh, face pretty much the same uh, thing that our clients regularly face, which is that the substance is certainly uh, meeting a need, but the lack of regulation around the quality of the product and the stigma associated with it is what's causing much of the harms associated with their use, which is a real shame. Um, but I think everybody in the room would like to thank you for your present presentation today. Thank you very much.